AMD's brand new Ryzen CPUs are making a lot of noise in the PC hardware market and giving Intel a run for their money, but as much as I'd like to, I'm not here to talk about Ryzen or Socket AM4. I'm here to talk about the Athlon 64 and the socket that housed it, Socket 754. It came to a time where Intel dominated the market with the Pentium 4 until AMD came along and showed them how it's done. And there was one processor that stood out from the rest, the ultimate Socket 754 CPU. The first thing to notice about this CPU is the lack of heat spreader. That's because this is a laptop CPU. When the Mobile Athlon 64 4000 Plus was released in August of 2005, AMD was already manufacturing dual-core CPUs for Socket 939, the socket released immediately after 754. AMD stuck with the latter socket for their mobile lineup though, which is why this CPU, with its 90 nanometer Newark core, takes the crown for the fastest Socket 754 CPU. It clocks at 2.6 GHz, up from the 2.4 GHz of the previous King, the desktop Athlon 64 3700+, and also packs 1 MB of L2 cache at a TDP of 62 watts. Compared to the competition from Intel's Pentium M at 27 watts, the Athlon appears hot and power hungry. But that won't be a problem here, because I'm going to install this CPU into a desktop and see what it can do. To ensure that the 4000 Plus shines its brightest, I'm going to be testing all games at 720p with low settings on 2GB of low latency DDR400 and an overclocked HD4670 AGP to avoid any bottlenecks. I'm also using Windows 7 64-bit as XP is too old and Windows 10 is too bloated. So with all that out of the way, let's see how the Mobile iPhone 64 4000 Plus games. We start with Sirius Sam HD, which played very smoothly unless the game was loading a new area. Xenotic was a bit of a disappointment. You won't see it in the footage, but it stutters. Badly. It's the last thing you want in a super fast game like this. Things looked a little better in Borderlands, but in more occupied areas the frame rate dipped into the teens. The CP redeems itself in Left 4 Dead 2, providing a more than satisfactory level of fluidity. Halo 2 wasn't much of a challenge for the Athlon, where it hit an impressive 100 FPS on average. I was somewhat let down by the Bioshock 2 results. Sometimes the game held 30 FPS, and other times the frame rate nosedived into the single digits for no discernible reason. Need for Speed Carbon did very well, averaging over 60 FPS with infrequent drops into the mid 30s. Grid was less smooth, but more consistent, managing to stay above 24 FPS even when wrecking and creating lots of smoke and particles. Trine 2 astonished me with its excellent visuals and buttery smooth frame rate, though the HD4670 hit up to 99% usage in this game. The CPU was still pegged at 100% the entire time, but it's dangerously close to shifting the load onto the GPU rather than the CPU. Next up is League of Legends, and the results here surprised me more than any of the others. The 4000 Plus averaged a comfortable 40 FPS, only dipping to 25 FPS with lots of units on screen, and 6 during the victory screen. Great results to see considering that it expected under 20 FPS average. I decided to test the 2013 Tomb Raider reboot as an afterthought, and the Athlon did reasonably well in the built-in benchmark, but fell apart in actual gameplay on Shipwreck Beach. This game officially requires a dual core, so I'm not surprised by the poor performance. As you saw, the gaming results were impressive, with a few exceptions, but as a quick reality check I specifically picked these games because I thought they would be suitable for a single core CPU like this. Try to throw something like Tomb Raider or Metro 2033 at the CPU and it's going to struggle. For games of the same age as the processor itself though, it'll have no trouble running them at high frame rates. But how does this Athlon 64 fare in non-gaming use? In general desktop use it's okay, if a little underwhelming. Less demanding tasks like music playback and web browsing with an ad blocker are usable, but anything involving internet video will disappoint you. 
Even with the H.264 FI Chrome extension in use and the HD4670 helping out with video decoding, watching YouTube at 1080p results in a mess of dropped frames and buffering, even with adequate internet speed. 720p is a little better in this regard. You'll get drop frames here and there when moving the mouse around the screen, but it's mostly flawless when sitting back and relaxing. When it comes to 480p, there are no problems at all. It's rock solid all the way through. In Handbrake, I tried converting a 1080p lossless render of my previous video to H.264 in both 1080p and 720p. And while this isn't an identical test to what I did back in May of 2015 with my ThinkPad T42, the Athlon did manage to outclass the 2.1GHz Pentium M. When it came to playing back the H.264 video, the HD4670 made the playback of both clips absolutely perfect, with no drop frames to be seen. Once I turned off the hardware decoding acceleration, it was downhill from there. The 720p video played back well for the most part, only losing frames in the transitions between clips, but 1080p did a lot worse, dropping frames almost constantly. As a final test after watching Socket Sanctuary's video involving Cinebench on an overclocked A64 3500 Plus, I ran it on this CPU and got a score of 56, four more than his 3500 Plus. Compare that to my FX 8370 that got 644. That's exactly 11 and a half times better. But this didn't come as much of a surprise to me. The CPU turns 12 years old this year and can't be expected to hold up that well for today's computing. And let's not forget that this is a mobile CPU running in a desktop. That presents some unique challenges of its own. For starters, this particular motherboard doesn't boot at the max speed of 2.6 GHz, instead defaulting to the lowest clock speed option of 800 MHz. This can be remedied with a utility called Crystal CPU ID that lets you create a desktop shortcut to set the voltage and multiplier of the CPU, but this has to be run on every boot, and if the OS decides to install updates after a reboot, you'll be stuck waiting for the 800 MHz CPU to churn through them all. Another inconvenience is the fact that the CPU has no heat spreader. I had to grind down the CPU cooler mounting bracket with a belt sander to get the cooler to make good contact. This could present problems if you ever decide to pop a processor with a heat spreader back into the system, as the cooler will sit lower and put more force onto the CPU surface. But don't think that I dislike this little guy, because I don't. You just need to have a good understanding of what you're getting into with a CPU like this. It's not perfect, and it won't give you great results in newer software. It's not practical, easy to find, or cheap, but it's interesting to see how far AMD took Socket 754, and if you enjoy the unconventional PC build or just like collecting old parts, the CPU might just be for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.